the story of my hometown. It is one of beauty, both natural and man-made, and the synthesis of these elements into a community. It is the story of perseverance, but also one of the triumph of civic engagement and the human spirit. A time capsule message dated August 3rd, 1912, and left by the directors of the Mountain Lakes Association in the cornerstone of the soon-to-rise railroad station begins with a wish. That the Mountain Lakes, which you shall know, shall have fulfilled the splendid promise of the Mountain Lakes of 1912. That the pure air shall still be untainted by factory fumes, the serene blue of your sky, undimmed by palls of smoke that the water from your artisan wells shall be as crystal, as clear, and as wholesome as that which we enjoy, that the scanty forest derelicts of our day shall have given place to stately shade trees, umbrageous and beautiful, that your vegetable bed shall be prolific, your orchard boughs bend beneath the burden of abundant fruitage, your flower gardens old-fashioned and alluring, your emerald lawns, like your lives, all velvet. That the mountain lake and the wildwood lake, which you shall call yours, be as lovely to your eyes as today they are to ours. That in all her aspects and through all the changing phases of the year, in the vernal green of spring, the full tide of summer, the glory of the painted hills of autumn, and the witchery of winter ice storms, mountain lakes, in the maturity of her charms, shall give you the pleasure and the joy she has given us in her youth. And while thus be speaking for you, a mountain lake's better still than that of today, in what is material and external, one further wish is ours. That the spirit of the place may endure, that the friendliness and neighborliness, the ready sympathy and the goodwill, the simplicity and frankness and camaraderie which we have known and which have contributed so much to our lives here may persist to your day and pervade and make pleasant the living in the mountain lakes you shall know. It all started with Herbert J. Hapgood, a Dartmouth graduate, class of 1896. By 1902, he was starting a family on Long Island, New York, with his wife, Ethel, and two children. He was working with his father-in-law, a successful manufacturer, on several projects, including the building of Shoreham Village on Long Island. Hapgood, however, was seeking a new project of his own, for which he looked towards New Jersey. There he found land he wished to purchase, roughly 30 miles west of Manhattan. It was an undeveloped piece of land described as a tangle of forest, underbrush, and boulders rising and dipping through the foothills of Booton. The main features of the property were its rolling hills and long meadow swamp at the foot of a small mountain known as the Torn. Dutch for tower. To the west were small ice ponds owned by the Mountain Ice Company, who in the winter sought out blocks of ice, which were stored in ice houses and distributed to fill ice boxes in people's homes. Along the eastern side of the land was a railroad, the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Line. The original design for the planned community included two man-made lakes, mountain, and wildwood, which offered beaches, swimming, and boating. Homes were laid out to complement the natural surroundings. The land was stripped of the trees as it was cleared for construction, and gardens, tennis courts, gazebos, and natural plantings were planted in their place. The winding roads climbed the hills and rounded the lakes, providing views of the land and water. The esplanade, at the train station, was built for a park entrance to the Mountain Lakes Residential Park. (music) 
Hapgood was influenced by the European arts and crafts movement in his design of the Mountain Lakes homes. The arts and crafts style had been introduced in America by Albert Hubbard and Gustav Stickley. This style represented quality and stability, a metaphor for the family lifestyle Hapgood wanted to create. To emphasize the natural environment, Hapgood used local materials such as chestnut wood for paneling, oak for strong floors, and boulder stone for foundations, retaining walls, and ornamental structures. The large fireplace placed at the center of each Hapgood home symbolized his philosophy of the family hearth. The architectural structure of the home was based on the American Foursquare, with uniqueness in the homes coming only from reversing floor plans and varying the outside facades. Hapgood marketed Mountain Lakes to New Yorkers looking to move out of the city. He ran advertising campaigns in many New York newspapers and designed promotional brochures with pictures of model homes and maps. He was quite the marketer, embellishing on the town's features and promising natural beauty, modern conveniences, beautiful construction, and social advantages. New Yorkers arrived in town on the Erie Lackawanna Railroad to see the new residential community. They were met with quite the surprise. On March 17, 1911, Mr. and Mrs. Lawrence Llewellyn and their two children became the first residents of Mountain Lakes when they moved into a new home on 46 Dartmouth Road. Mr. Llewellyn was the founder of the individual paper drinking cup company now known as the Dixie Cup Company. The Llewellyns were followed by the Garnaz family on Hillcrest and the Backer family on 7 Barton Road, who brought the first car to town, a Ford, and the Houston family moved into 35 Dartmouth Road across the street from the Llewellyns. In May that year, the Cleveland family moved into Oak Lane, whose daughter, Mary Jarvis Cleveland, was the first baby born in town on May 13, 1911. These first families were known as the original Mountain Lakes Pioneers. These early pioneer families found many challenges. The town did not yet have all Hapgood had described in his advertising. There was no mail, no street signs, no lights, only dirt roads, no school, no church, no store, initially no train station, no cars, no telephone, no gas, no plumbing. In fact, early residents would walk to a spring to get their water, and when plumbing came into the homes that was promised as an artisan well water system, was actually pond water, which was discovered when frogs and pollywogs came out through the kitchen faucets. In May of 1911, as these first families were settling in, Lila Houston decided to host a social gathering to meet her new neighbors and share their frustrations of coping with the challenges they were facing as new settlers. From Lila Houston, We all liked our houses and believed in the future of Mountain Lakes, even though there were many things to be done and endured before the dream which had brought us come true. Over a century later, we continue to celebrate this gathering as the founding day of Mountain Lakes, as it was the day the community members first came together and decided to preserve and turn Mountain Lakes into the charming town we know today. A week later, on May 26th, desiring to guide the town's future, John Houston and Lawrence Llewellyn met to form a residence club. The Mountain Lakes Association was formed with the goal to monitor Hapgood and organize the community. Hapgood's development was in full swing. He had set up a sawmill and a plumbing shop, wood and paint shops on site, 
and recruited laborers from Booton and Denville to build the homes. Mountain Lakes is unusual in that 500 of the original homes were built in the same style by one developer, Hapgood, and the approximately 450 original houses still remaining is one of the largest collections of craftsmen houses in the United States. Hapgood also convinced Morris County Traction Company to build a direct trolley line that ran through the center of his new development, providing transportation alongside the newly named dirt road, the boulevard. Horses, buggies, pedestrians, primitive automobiles, and trolleys all traveled together along the boulevard between Booton and Parsippany Turnpike, later known as Route 46. The trolley lasted 17 years and connected Mountain Lakes from Denville to Booton. It ran every 30 minutes with stops along the boulevard. Residents would take the trolley to Booton to shop, go to the grocery stores, and visit doctors. On November 15, 1912, the first scheduled train stop occurred in Mountain Lakes and the station was built. The train became the primary means of commuting to work. It was only a 40-minute ride into the city, making Mountain Lakes the ideal place to commute from. Most men would leave on the train together on the 7.28 or 8.06 a.m. trains and arrive home together at the train station at 6.20 p.m. The activity of daily life revolved around that set schedule. As the husbands took the train to New York City for work each day, it was the women of Mountain Lakes who were left to create the community. Their role in their families was extended into the community to create schools, churches, clubs, gardens, and the new community's culture. Even with dirt roads and no water supply, the women found a way to remain positive and persevere. Club after club began to form in Mountain Lakes. From the 1913 Flower Guild, to the Educational Department, which founded the Mountain Lakes Free Public Library in the Lake Drive School in 1916. Most notably, feminists banded together to form the Mountain Lakes Women's Club in 1914, with Belle de Rivera, a famous suffragist and Mountain Lakes resident as president, they formed a committee that preserved women's interests in drama, civics, arts, international relations, home economics, education, and social welfare. The College Club of Mountain Lakes was founded by Elsa Muser as women sought to find ways to meet other college-educated women with which to socialize. The community church was built in 1914. Mountain Lakes was soon booming with personality, fishing, canoeing, horseback riding, ice skating, Performing plays and listening to music were all common activities in our little town. It became the much-needed escape from the hustle and bustle of the city that everyone dreamed of. As Hapgood had intended, the children grew up with the freedom, safety, and privilege to explore and savor the beautiful outdoors of mountain lakes. Kids would spend their free time exploring the Torn and the woods around the town. Winters were a lot of fun during the early days of Mountain Lakes. Kids would sleigh ride during big snowstorms. North Glen was a popular sleigh riding hill. In good snow, kids would go all the way down the hill to the boulevard and often across the street. Janet Borstert recalled, I went sleigh riding whenever we had snow. Back in those days, they used to block off North Glen, which was then called Addington Avenue. And on really good snow, you could not only go all the way down the hill, but you could cross the boulevard, which sounds horrible today. And the lakes provided a source for hockey and bonfires and, of course, skating. We used to get up and shovel paths through the snow. We used to have certain places where we would build bonfires. Summers, too, were spent with activities on the lake. Mountain Lakes Club had a beach, and most families enjoyed a private beach on Wildwood Lake across from the current elementary school referred to as Leonard's Beach. 
which housed a sandy beach and diving boards. Mountain Lakes has been rooted in outdoor recreation since its establishment. Memorial Day was a celebration of America and all that it stood for. Mountain Lakes has a history of supporting the country, embedding a deep patriotism in the community. It's what makes Memorial Day celebration meaningful and special still to this day. As Jerome Wyckoff shared in his oral history, I have some vivid memories from World War I days, including visiting nearby Army Camp in Pompton Lakes, my parents hosting wounded soldiers, rushing out onto Lake Drive, banging pots and pans on Armistice Day. Fourth of July was celebrated much like today, with fireworks, swimming races, canoe races, and lots of parties at the Mountain Lakes Club. No community was complete without a school system to educate the next generation of Lakers. Only a year after the first families moved in, the leaders of the Mountain Lakes Association formed an education committee and began their planning to start a Mountain Lakes school system. They believed that schools should teach students to be the next generation of civically engaged participants in our democracy, and this became the future vision for Mountain Lakes. In 1912, the Mountain Lakes School of Individual Instruction opened up in a tiny house on 8 Larchdale Way. After one year, it was clear that the two teachers and a one-bedroom house could not support the growing population of Mountain Lakes. The official Mountain Lakes School, or the Stone School, as it was known at the time, soon opened its doors to students. Hapgood situated it between the Mountain Lakes Club and the Boulevard. This school is now known as Lake Drive. It was common that students would look forward to a special treat they received during their lunch breaks. Doretta Steinway recalled, I would go up the stairs at the Mountain Lakes Club and get a five-cent ice cream after lunch. The lunch hour is spent with children running up and down the stairs. Most of the time, school children would go home for lunch. Lunch was an hour then, so kids could walk home and back after their meal. A lot of kids spent their lunches at the Mountain Lakes Club, a popular destination for kids to hang out. I remember sitting on the grounds of the Mountain Lakes Club before the pool was there as a teenager. We used to gather there practically every afternoon. I remember playing tennis on the courts. Generally, probably went to school functions, dances, and football games. Now, the club is still used for socializing, playing tennis, and bowling. The Stone School was small and only fit K-9th through graders. 10th, 11th, and 12th graders took the trolley to Morristown High School every day. It was not until the 1930s that the town fully established its own educational system with the first Mountain Lakes High School on Briarcliff Road. The class of 1939 was the first to go through all four years of high school in the Briarcliff School. The families of Mountain Lakes have since its inception placed large emphasis on education and the schools have always garnered a positive reputation. Since the early days of Mountain Lakes, sports was popular and spirited. Kids would play basketball in the Mountain Lakes School Gym at Lake Drive. Baseball was played in fields that lay east of the train tracks, which would become known as Diaper Village when U.S. servicemen returned from the war and started their young families. 1938, the high school won its first football game against St. Bernard's School. In her oral history, Janet Borstert recalls the excitement that the win and the students doing a snake dance up the boulevard to celebrate. She recalls, we drove down the main street honking madly. Everyone sort of smiled at us in a rather patronizing way. Mountain Lakes had finally won a football game. Similar to the practice done when the high school sports teams wins a championship today. Mountain Lakes has always been big on sports and outdoor activities, from swimming in the lakes to playing baseball during the war periods and eventually expanding to football and the now popular lacrosse.
Since year one, Lakers have been spirited and this is rooted in our Laker pride. Dubbed by former Principal Wilkins as the spirit here, it's something to rally around. Everyone supports everybody, academics and athletics. It's values and spirit of the community. Nineteen fourteen brought the construction of the Mountain Lakes Club, the stores on Midvale Road, which housed Yacarino's grocery store, owned by a family in town, drug store, a small ice cream parlor, and at various times the post office and library. The Great Blizzard of nineteen fourteen, with six foot snowdrifts, which left Mountain Lakes without electricity for a month. By January of 1922, Hapgood had built hundreds of arts and crafts homes in Mountain Lakes, but tragedy was around the corner. As he made some unfortunate business decisions, his home sales were slowing, yet he continued to build and become more involved in a state road development project. Soon, he found himself overextended and borrowing from the New York banks to support his company. In the end, Hapgood was in debt with more than a million dollars of unsold homes on his hands, plus heavy mortgage debt, much of which came from homes that did not yet exist. Legend has it that Hapgood had swindled the banks into financing phantom homes. Since so many of the homes look similar, Hapgood drove the inspectors around and around throughout our hilly, winding roads, showing them the same houses over and over. Bankruptcy ensued, and Hapgood fled to South America, never to be seen in Mountain Lakes again. Hapgood's bankruptcy threatened the property restrictions which had been guaranteed by his development company. The Mountain Lakes Association was also suspicious of new developers who might not respect the existing property restrictions and thereby change the character of the community. After much discussion, the association decided that we had to become self-governing. In less than a year, the Mountain Lakes Association had gained unanimous community support for incorporation of Mountain Lakes as a borough in April of 1924. In June, we elected our first mayor, William R. Doremus, and our first borough council, Mayor Doremus was also co-owner of the Mountain Lakes News, and therefore aware of everything that happened in town. The newspaper became a part of our civic fiber, a democratic instrument that played a major role in keeping residents informed. Ultimately, Mountain Lakes Incorporated was recognized as the Bell Hall Company, which built Tudors, Norman, English Cottage, and Colonial Homes, along with arched stone pillars to mark the entrances to town. These homes looked a little different than the rest. As the Roaring Twenties rolled onward, so too did the community celebrations, lawn parties, pool parties, and club events, attended by an ever-growing cast of larger-than-life residents. There was famous writer and playboy Arthur Stringer, Miles Browning, who famously landed a naval seaplane on Mountain Lake to the cheers of a crowd assembled at the club. Gustav Hinrichs, the father of opera in Philadelphia, actor playwright Willard Mack and his wife, Famous film actress Pauline Frederick, who was known for habit of keeping pet lions and bears on her estate. And the Hill family, who operated a sideshow for Barnum and Bailey Circus and were known for housing their animals, including elephants and a camel, at their Pollard Road home. As our country entered an economic depression, Halsey Frederick served as our mayor. From 1933 through 1944, Frederick served as a man who believed in the community, in civic involvement, and the public interest. He made it possible for us to survive the depression. 
when property after property was turned over to the banks for non-payment of mortgages. The Bell Hall Company was no longer able to construct new homes and was driven into bankruptcy. Once again, Mountain Lakes faced losing control of its future. Mayor Frederick realized we had to buy land in order to control it and our future. He purchased mortgage properties for a small fraction of their worth. In addition to being financially successful, this action enabled Mountain Lakes to maintain its original design, character, and lifestyle. In the 1930s, Mountain Lakes Historical Society was established, lending significance and appreciation to the colorful history of our town. It wasn't until half a century later, however, that our borough council began to wrestle with the concept of historic preservation just as Hapgood homes were being torn down. In 1992, borough council appointed John Steen as borough historian and formed a historic preservation commission to look into forming a historic district protecting the 450 remaining Hapgood homes. Fundamental questions were raised. What's here to preserve? Is Mountain Lakes historic? What makes something worthy of preservation? For many of us, it is hard to put into words what makes Mountain Lakes so special. It is an intangible sense of place that is grounded in the tangible elements of our community. The rolling hills, the boulder stone walls, the natural materials found in well-placed, simple arts and crafts style stucco homes, physical elements which remind us of our past, of Hapgood, of Llewellyn and Houston, of the pioneers and all who followed, of the civic commitment of our citizens, the human spirit, resilience, and love that built this place. <laughs>